How did it all begin? What awakens any passion? It might have been that moment in youth when innocent awareness of the miracle of flight turns to wonder that insects are able to fly at all. Maybe it was Stephen Dalton's surprise that so few photographs had been taken of insects actually on the wing. Perhaps it was something of both these reactions, which later, as a student of photography, drew him towards that most elusive of all photographic Everests, insects in flight. The bumblebee, the most exotic butterfly. Flying insects are a photographer's nightmare. Fast, unpredictable, evasive, beautiful in their airborne dance, but always just out of camera reach. To Dalton, a seductive challenge. Birds like the kestrel, giants of the air compared with insects, may seem relatively easy to photograph. But even these more predictable and easily observed creatures have their problems. Stephen's preparations are more reminiscent of major tree surgery than a photographic operation. But the young kestrels will soon leave the nest, 18 feet up in the ash tree. His chance for the photograph will fly with them. So for Stephen and his wife Liz, it's a race against time. Lenny wants to go higher. Higher? Yeah. Oh. What about that? Yeah, I think that's better. Could you possibly nip up the yeah. um, scaffolding and have a look from the camera? While the young kestrels remain inside the hollow of the tree, the parents, who have already left the nest, will make regular visits with food. The Daltons must take care if the adult kestrels are not to be frightened away from the brood altogether. No, that's how, how does this look? Yes, that's all right. I don't think what? it's anything in the way. Nothing in the picture at all? No. This is OK? Yeah. Could you pass, pass me the um, synthetic kestrel? Thanks. I was wondering whether you could just check the, the viewfinder. I want to see whether it's in the picture where it comes in and where, and where it leaves. Now, the bird should come in, hopefully, about fr from here, yep. and the beam will break about there. Now, is it in the picture? Yes, all of it's in the picture. It is. Yep. Now, is it in the picture if, I, if it comes in from here? Yes, it still is. It is. And it goes out about there? Yeah, that's right. I see. Right, fine. I'm just going to check the triggering system. So I'll switch everything on. The photograph will be taken automatically as the kestrel breaks a beam of light shining onto a photoelectric cell. Right, I'm just going to check the beam. I'll pass my hand through it and see whether it fires. Yep, it's firing. Let's check it again. Fine. Of course, things never happen to order. After days of torrential rain, not even one critical test picture for me to check focus and composition. There was a real danger that damp would seep into the high-voltage flash unit and so, quite literally, blow everything up. For two whole days, Nothing. Then, on the third day, over the hedge, she began her approach. All over in six disastrous seconds. The bird missed the beam altogether. No picture. At least the chicks seem to be enjoying their diet of starling. Interestingly, not the more usual supply of small mice and voles.
By the end of the second week, time and patience almost exhausted, I watch the young Kestrel sensing the arrival of the parent. But will the camera? The trials and tribulations of three weeks' effort reduced to no more than a dozen transparencies of doubtful material. After all the disappointments, I'm not optimistic, but hopeful always that perhaps one image will be the shot I'm after. Well, the snag is here that the bird's is hardly in the frame in most cases. Got the wings chopped off and all this sort of thing. Some lovely shots of the, of the young just sort of poking their heads out of the hole. And the thing is, there's just no parent bird. Obviously, the thing has missed the beam. Oh, this looks a little bit better. The wings are chopped off. The, the tips of the wings are, are missing. Um, but um, here we've got the, the adult just about to alight with a starling. Looks a bit bloody. And there's another one here. We, we can't see the head at all. The wings have covered the, the head of the bird. And this time, we've got the wings actually in the picture, but the tail's missing. So you just can't win, really. They all look a little bit blue, but this is due to... Um, I, was, I was using um, a new type of film, and um, we, we've got sort of high-intensity reciprocity failure due to the the high speed of the flash is going off at a 25 thousandth of a second and really it wanted a, um, another filter. Filters, high intensity reciprocity failure, sheer luck. Look again at the cine film of the Kestrel's final approach. Freeze one frame and blow out the blurred image. Technically, the comparison is not strictly fair, but the quality of the still image taking 500 times faster in one twenty-five thousandth of a second, speaks for itself. Every professional photographer has to find a market for his material. Stephen has been luckier than some in the opportunity he's had for his work to be published. Getting pictures seen and bought is a procedure in which photographers are inevitably, if not always willingly, involved. This reception in London is to launch Stephen's new book, the product of four years of flight photography. The debris of celebration is in striking contrast with the exacting demands of photography. The art has come a long way from the more formal images of the old days, times remembered by Eric Hosking, another photographer famous for successful bird photography. Uh, is that, um, That's done in an old, old disused railway carriage in the middle of the field. It's used actually as a cattle, you know, yeah. cattle. And uh, they used to, you know, they, uh, the But did you, uh, is that using a photoelectric cell? Photoelectric cell, yes. Uh, yes. It all is. Yep. The other one that I found so fascinating was this kingfisher. I, mean, I think the texture that you've got there is quite, uh, is quite in incredible. What, uh, are, these done, uh, are these prints done from the transparency? No, these prints are, um, in fact, uh, we made 10 by 8 internegatives. From 35 from millimeter, millimeter, millimeter codochromes. From codochromes, yeah. what, codochrome, codochrome two. 2 in yes. those days, yes. yeah. And there's similar sort of thing here, I suppose. Yeah, exactly the same. It's incredible. I mean, the detail that you retained in here, um, 35 mil, I think it's quite fantastic. In an oak tree, you see. In an oak tree, yeah. A starling kicks off from the trunk of a tree. Just look at the astonishing position of those wings as a coltit streaks from its nest. A blue tit.
Notice the propeller action at the wingtips of this stock dove. I took this picture of a barn owl in a violent thunderstorm. Owls have led Stephen on many photographic adventures. One of the most memorable happened on the roof of this Surrey church. When Stephen made the first exploratory climb with the vicar, the Reverend Roy Boff, he had no idea of the success he and a friend, Andrew Anderson, would achieve. Well, then, if you let me get up first, I'll... They remember the daylight hours spent preparing the electronics, which were very crude in those days, and the difficulty of getting the camera close enough to the owl's flight path across the church roof. That's it. Good. OK. Yep, fine. Now, the thing is, as you know, the owl is nesting in the bottom of, the, of this tower. Yes. And um, at the moment, it's using any of these eight entrances. Uh -huh. So what we want to do is to block up seven of the entrances yep. so that it only uses the one we wish. In fact, what we would like it to do is to fly in from this side so we can get it flying in at a right angle from where we are yes, into, I that, see. into that mm. aperture. Uh -huh. But where to place the camera? The thing which might worry you a little bit is that we need to hide somewhere around about here. Yes. So you want to shoot from that here. Yeah. The hide, concealing the camera, was precarious. The flashlights were suspended outward on wooden poles. Then, the nights of vigil in the darkness of late summer. A barn owl in flight. I was thrilled with the result but its wings are beating only three or four times a second. The fastest insects beat their wings a thousand times every second. Technically a daunting prospect. Mm, now the wind is hopeless, any wind the practical difficulty of locating, then focusing on such miniature action. It would, of course, be possible to tether flying insects in front of the camera lens. But I rejected the idea out of hand. My insects had to be unfettered, free to fly, no strings attached. Stephen was not alone in his determination to photograph insects in flight. It was an essential feature of research being done by Charles Ellington at the zoology department of Cambridge University. Ellington's technique involves the use of high-speed cine cameras which take up to 8,000 pictures every second. Here, bees are being released into a small flight chamber. The triggering photoelectric beam is switched on. As the bee breaks the beam, the lights and camera will be fired into action. In slow motion, a second or two of a bee in flight is stunning. The rowing action of the wings sustains lift, maintains forward motion and steers the bee. butterfly suddenly becomes a creature of the most delicate complexity. The clap fling of the wings through the repeated cycle. These images, with all their imperfections, 
are made by stretching black and white cine photography to the limit. Adequate enough for scientists exploring the clinical precision of flight, but far from Stephen's ideal of needle-sharp images in full colour, with that glancing ray of sunlight so much a part of the natural world of flight. I had to overcome two key problems. To devise a way of detecting a rapidly moving object the size of a pinhead at a precise point in space, and to produce a flash bright enough to expose slow colour film at small apertures, yet fast enough to freeze the wing beat. My objectives, I was told, were conflicting, impractical fantasies. It seemed pointless to proceed. Thankfully, I met someone who disagreed. Ron Perkins was then at the Farnborough Royal Aircraft Establishment. An electronics expert, he believed it was possible to build a fast and powerful flash unit that would meet my fine limits. Within a year, Ron had made a flash unit that would discharge a lethal 3,000 volts in a 25 thousandth of a second. But now, to fire the flash with the insect in focus, a task that would extend my ingenuity to its limit. The head of the match represents the point of focus. An artificial fly made from cork and celluloid represents the flying insect. As the insect comes towards the match, it passes through an invisible triggering beam and so fires the flash. The blurred fly comes into the field of focus. The critical depth of field is less than one millimetre. I calculated that a fast-flying insect would remain in that vital millimeter for as little as one thousandth of a second. Far too short a time for a normal camera shutter to open and take the picture. This major snag of mechanical delay is inherent in all conventional shutters. To precisely measure the delay, I set up another simple experiment. With a pendulum to represent the insect, I swung it across the circular eye of a photoelectric cell at one metre a second, the speed of a slow insect. Now the test proper with flash unit connected and film in the camera. The film will provide a visual measurement of the shutter delay. Now I have to wait half a minute. For my shutter to be effective, the pendulum must be dead centre of the picture, right over the photoelectric cell. In fact, it's travelled 130 millimetres past it, an intolerable delay of more than one-tenth of a second. All shutters have this delay, in which time an insect could be right out of the picture. All shutters except perhaps this one. The design of our electronic shutter
took months of care and thought. To this day, it remains one of our most closely guarded secrets. We'd already made fruitless attempts to fire shutters with springs, exploding fuses, even dynamite caps. Now, lashed onto the front of my camera, only one question remained. Would it work? Spot on. 50 times faster than a conventional shutter. A 4 50th of a second to find the fly that triggers the shutter that fires a flash that takes the picture. Roxy, sit. Sit. At last, the individual components were complete, and Stephen could begin the most exciting photography he'd ever attempted. It was a hot July afternoon and the Sussex countryside was buzzing with ideal subjects, hoverflies. These charming and beneficial creatures are easy to catch and fly more or less in straight lines. Rather than bringing the complex equipment to the insects, I decided to collect them and photograph them in a miniature indoor countryside. All that remained now was to discover how well my countryside would suit the hoverflies. Camera, triggering system and flash unit are grouped around the miniature environment. At the centre, the flight tunnel. All that's needed now is a blossom or two to set the scene. I'll just arrange the foreground. Drawn to the sunlight from the darkness of the flight tunnel, the hoverfly will come up over the launching platform, soar over the flower, and so trigger the shutter at the point of focus. I just line up the light beam accurately. The triggering beam, invisible as ever, shines across the flight path. It's absolutely in alignment with the photographic cell. So you get three beams of light so that the fly has to break one of three beams in order to fire the mechanism. The beam can be adjusted to be sensitive to the tiniest flying insect. Select the background and flight photography can begin. place the hoverfly in here and hope it crawls up to the top. For a brief moment, the fly flutters inside the tunnel before bolting for the sunlight. It's going up. Oh, this is rather interesting. When I f first saw this, I thought there was nothing in the picture at all. And then I noticed this little dot, and I thought, what's going on? And of course, you know, one of the things when we're taking these photographs, the thing often went off for no apparent reason. And we thought it was something wrong with the electronics or, you know, sort of damp air or something. But no, I stuck it under the enlarger and did a, a, a blow up. It turned out to be this thing, which is a green fly. 
Um, probably the first time a green fly has ever been photographed in flight. Ah, oh, now we've got another fly actually in focus. And um, let's just get it it's a bit better. Even now, I'm still aware of the limited depth of field. The wings are in focus, but the head is just out. Here, the focus is absolutely right. Everything pin sharp. Half a millimetre forward or back, then focus would have been soft on either the head or wings. Incidentally, the wings are midway through their upstroke. This one's really shifting. Undercarriage raised well up under the body. Head critically sharp, antennae bristling. Here, the wings are at the start of their downstroke. The face of the fly looks a bit like Dougal in the Magic Roundabout as it flips through the air with all the speed and accuracy of a most complex flying machine. In the very act of reaching one objective, Stephen became fascinated by yet another photographic challenge. His evening drives to Ron Perkins' home continued with increasing regularity. Here, the dining room table was again being prepared, this time to feed the electronic appetite of a new creation, high-speed multi-flash. This simulates the camera shot. Oh, I see, yes. By pressing that, we then should get a sequence of pulses. A sequence of multi-flash studies might offer a new insight into how insects fly. I could already take single pictures of insects, represented here by the travelling dot on the oscilloscope screen. Pictures like this housefly, as it lifts off a crust of wholemeal bread. Or, in another 25 thousandth of a second, this single flash picture of a paper wasp from the Everglades of Florida. Or again, this mud dauber wasp, flying over a cactus, its wings twisted through 180 degrees. I wanted to photograph its progress in several stages across the field of view. And, from the Everglades again, a splendid dragonfly. For insects like this, Ron developed a flash unit that would take a series of images. One, two, three, four, even more, all in rapid succession. As soon as the camera shutter contacts close, which has been represented by the switch here, it triggers off this unit, which produces seven flashes. You imagine the insect is flying through, and every time it goes vertically, the flash will fire, and you can imagine that is the insect, and that will be the position in the field of view. Just Find that again so you can see it once more. There you are. Every time it goes vertically. Intriguing. And you can alter the timing now, of, by of these. The, by, by means to prove the multi-flash technique, I once again chose an owl, this time flying across my kitchen. Each feather crisp and sharp as the wing flexes in response to the thrust and lift of every beat. All forms of flight just fascinate me. OK, right. Now oh, then, you keep with me, Joanna. And once we can hit up, you'll, you must take over, OK? That's if we can get it up. That's it. Now hold the left one. That's it. Now the right. That's excellent. Super. You've got it. It's all yours. Terrific. Now loop it to the right. And again, one more. That's it. Now then, that's enough. Whoops. Left. That's it. Now get up, up again, and once you've got it up high, do three loops to the left. So I pull the left one, release the right one. That's it. One, two, three. Look up. 
the excitement of contact with unseen eddies and currents. The forces which influence everything that flies. A children's kite, an aircraft, the most delicate living creature. Whoops, look out, when you lose it, look out. Okay, leave go, Joanna, for a moment, let's see if I can get it up. No, oh. To suddenly spread wings and take to the air has always been the unfulfilled wish of man. Maybe it's this same urge that compels me to study the more familiar and the most exotic creatures that enjoy the unrestricted freedom of the sky. To find such exotic creatures, Stephen and Liz set off to the jungles of Venezuela. The city of Maracay is a thriving modern community with a population exceeding half a million. Like the language and so much of the Venezuelan culture, the Spanish atmosphere is everywhere. Spain's conquest of South America echoes still in the sounds of the city and in the stucco splendor of the bullring. sprawls across the sun-parched countryside at the foot of a spectacular limestone and granite hill range. It stretches along much of Venezuela's Caribbean coast. This mat of closely woven rainforest is the size of Dartmoor and it's the oldest of Venezuela's national parks. Each turn of the wheel, each twist of the road, you can feel the temperature dropping from the 90s on the plain to the comfortable 70s in the mountains. Hummingbirds hover around the treetops in air that is heavy with tropical scents and filled with mysterious and tantalizing noises. stuff here and you can get down here. A green mosaic frog bathes in the cool shadow. Above, a tropical wren feeds on the endless supply of nectar to be found in this place. You step with the utmost caution. Beneath your feet, an enormous eye, an owl butterfly with a wingspan larger than my hand. The Venezuelan jungle is an everlasting Sussex summer, just so much richer. A garden made for insects, full of exotic opportunity for the high-speed camera. Orange heliconids, morphos, then this superb creature, again a heliconid. This is my third attempt to catch it. It can afford this almost brazen invitation because its enemies have learnt that it has a most unpleasant taste.
It's quite good to super specimen. It does, isn't it? Let's try to get the... There's a lovely one. Okay, we don't lose it. Of course, this is this is the um, the heliconid, which is um, we had a quite similar one last week, which was um, from a completely different group, which looks very very similar. Beautiful, isn't it? And this and the other one mimics yeah. this. That lovely green. Yes, that, that should um, that should be suspended in flight. To protect it from damage. The green heliconid is wrapped for the 20 kilometre journey to the flight tunnel, which I've set up in an air-conditioned room of the hotel. Here, unhampered by high humidity, each butterfly will fly on stage to face the camera using the single flash technique. Liz releases the butterfly. Unharmed by its temporary confinement, she gently eases the proboscis onto a slice of melon. Come on, then. Flight makes enormous energy demands on all flying creatures. That's good. He likes that. Oh, I think I can leave him alone drinking that. Thank you. Had enough now. Stephen, he's ready. Oh, what is it? Thanks. Now, if you can watch from the from the front there and just let me know what's going on, because I'm not quite sure how he's going to react. It's coming up the board. He's stuck. He's stuck. I can probably encourage it. Oh, yes. A twenty-five thousandth of a second in the life of a green heliconid. The same for a dagger wing butterfly. Here, the camera records the minute wing scales of the dagger wing as they scatter like specks of dust just after takeoff. It's said that the Virgin Mary was born on the eighth day of the ninth month. Both numbers are just discernible on the wings of the miracle butterfly. Four studies of a skeleton butterfly. The skeleton spends its days weaving slowly between exotic vines and air plants. A giant Venezuelan grasshopper. A damselfly. A beetle projects itself, wing cases in disarray, between the stems of a heliconia flower. It's difficult to believe that this extraordinary creature the harlequin beetle, can actually fly. Can fly. Liz, could you give us a hand with this? It, it's clinging. So if you've got very, it just hooks on with these feet. Thanks. What a lovely looking face he has. How are we going to photograph him in flight? I, I, I just don't know. Because he won't go through the flight tunnel. So I had to adapt the hotel itself to photograph this weird subject. The hotel corridor becomes a flight tunnel and a log of wood for Harlequin's launching platform. 
Harlequin, heliconids, butterflies and insects by the millions in this remarkable landscape. Two thousand metres up in this wilderness, it seems nothing can ever change. But within the hour, on almost every day of the tropical year, there comes a transformation which is one of the most spectacular events I have ever seen. They call it simply the Nublina. Moisture-laden air from the Caribbean coast ascends the mountains. After a day exposed to the tropical heat, it condenses and drapes the peaks. The delicate shawl of mist becomes the wettest blanket, soaking the vegetation, producing the riotous growth that creates the cloud forest with all its diversity of natural life. 20 kilometers away, Marakai is still drenched in sun. Here, in the total embrace of the Neblina, night has already begun. One almost expects to find some secret dwelling, a temple of some rain god of the Incas, perhaps, and the mystery is complete. A remarkable mind to conceive of such a place as this. Rancho Grande, built, some say, as a mountain fortress, less romantically as a luxury hotel. Now, a concrete memorial to an unfinished dream. But amazingly, a light shines at Rancho Grande. Little green chap with orange underwings. Another green moss with orange blobs on the leading edges of its wings. Oh, Liz, look, we've got one of these huge no uh, noctuid moths. Witch moths. Whoops, it, it's off. There's another one here. There we are, look at that. All these blues and purples and golds. Beautiful specimen. Here, in one hour, on the balcony of what might have been a hotel, in the heart of a cloud forest, an incandescent lamp can attract more moths than I might normally expect to see in a lifetime. It's quite overwhelming, the variations in size and colour. There are more species of insects in the world than all other groups of animals put together. Maybe a million more to be identified. Scientists come here from all over the world to struggle with the task of unravelling the life patterns of these moths. Each creature deserves months of study. I can spare only minutes. It's difficult to tear oneself away from the moths of Rancho Grande. Come on, you obstinate thing. I don't know whether it's sleepy or whether it's obstinate. 
There we are. That should take off any moment. Ah. Oh. A dull serried moth in multi flash. Three images, again in multi flash, a flannel moth. A pericopid moth. Multi flash of a leaf beetle. An orange heliconid. A green hawk moth, Pluto. More hawk moths. And from out to the Venezuelan night, the black witch moth. To probe into the world of insect flight, to be able to portray some of their aerial secrets is an enormous privilege. Yet, somehow, even pictures seem inadequate. How little we really understand, how much remains to be discovered. But while there's a wing beat to trigger a shutter, to fire a flash, to take a picture, I know that I shall find it difficult to resist my passion for exploring the miracle of flight.